You are listening to the Mary Jane Society podcast, where you will meet entrepreneurs, cultivators, scientists, doctors, and inventors in the cannabis industry. I'm your host, Pam Schmiel, marketer and publicist in the cannabis industry. As the cannabis industry and its needs evolve, customized machinery and equipment are needed to support its growth. Today, our guest is Ryan Hoyt, the inventor and CEO of the vape filling company, VapeJet. Vapes are the second best selling product in the country and the demand for rosin based or solventless products is increasing. And with that comes the need for improved machinery. Ryan talks about how he needs to stay ahead of trends in the industry to ensure his machinery can adapt to the consumer's changing consumption preferences. If you're thinking of launching a vape brand, you should listen in. Ryan shares great insights in what to consider as far as the equipment you need to get the job done. Let's welcome Ryan. Uh, what prompted you to start VapeJet and what is VapeJet? So we're just going to start with that. <laughs> so after I got out of the Navy, I was working in the private industry doing uh, launch uh, services for a company called Intelsat, uh, did telemetry systems among, along, uh, you know, teleport services, you know, beaming video all across the world, setting up uh, communication channels, stuff like that. I've built a couple of uh, teleport sites and things like that. So I, you know, my traditional background was all in aerospace, RF, stuff like that. I had, and being that I came from a military slash government contractor background. Oh, I never even touched weed. No, no, no. That was a, that was a terrible thing. Uh, so I hadn't even experienced, I won't go through the full story, but when I was 30 years old, my doctor was like, you should try this instead of all the sleeping meds you're on. I tried, uh, and my doctor actually, I, I went to a dispensary. I walked in and I was like, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never been even been around it. And I asked them the question. I was like, wait, it's $45 for an eighth. An eighth of what, a pound? No, no, an eighth of an ounce. And I'm like, wait, this stuff like grows in dirt. <laughs> so I went home and without ever growing anything, without ever being involved in the cannabis industry, I built a giant grow room um, because I had the means. And And you lived in California. That was the big, that was the big one. At the time, it was the Prop 215 days, so I got a bunch of patients. They all gave me their recs. I grew their plants for them. Not growing before, but also having a very technical mind. You go. Anyway, so I progressed from that, um, and then I just decided to get out of the aerospace industry, get out of the government contracting, um, and kind of forge out on my own. My first entry into the cannabis industry, I... I you know, grew and I had delivery services and things like that in Southern California who didn't at the time. Um, but my big thing was I wrote some software for uh, monitoring your grow. So I just wrote a little cell phone app for, hey, recording, you know, your grow room and taking pictures of your plant and keeping track of everything. And a company that caught a company at the time's eye called Cabinet Grow. They were a company based out of uh, Irvine, California. And they built self-contained grow chambers for, you know, growing cannabis at home. Um, this is, you know, back in the 20, I think 2014, 2015 timeframe. And it was the, actually the very first cannabis focused IPO. Um, so they went through the actual IPO process to get listed as a pink sheet and everything else like that. And it was a great learning experience. The business didn't end up doing very well. I got brought on as the CTO, but, um, you know, not anyway, it was a good learning experience and a good foot in the door to the cannabis industry. From there, I've done various roles, a lot of consulting, a lot of, uh, you know, set, doing things like setting up credit card processing for dis or ATM card processings and all sorts of technical things you can throw at the cannabis industry. I probably had my hand in it one time or another. Uh, towards 26, 2017, 18 timeframe, uh, uh, I was doing a lot of work for friends who had distillate labs here in Southern California. And I just saw teams of people sitting around tables with syringes, filling vape carts. 
And I looked at it and I was like, there's got to be some better way to do this. And so I went <laughs> online and I saw there were companies in the space. Um, there were a couple, you know, of at the time, uh, this isn't a bad thing. I'm not like calling out competitors. I'm, this is uh, at the time it was uh, Thompson Duke, Convectium, and a couple of the little ones here and there that were in the cartridge uh, filling space. And they were good, you know, nothing wrong with those solutions. Um, they didn't really fit my friend's business at the time. And me kind of being a DIY kind of person, I was like, I'll take a stab at this. So I prototyped the first one um, and we did a proof of concept. Unfortunately, that business never really went anywhere, but I had already built the prototype for the cartridge filler and just posted something on YouTube. Didn't think anything of it. And six months to a year later, I had actually moved up to Oregon to um, just relax for a bit in between startups and businesses and whatnot. And somebody, uh, his name was, uh, I'll, I'll leave his name out of it, but uh, he knows who he is and he's probably listening. And as always, thank you. Uh, a person out of the blue contacted me on YouTube and said, hey, I need that machine. And so I packed up what was left of my prototype and finished everything. And I drove it down to his lab in Southern Oregon and finished prototyping it out. And once we were done with that process, I saw that there was a product here, something that wasn't just a one-off build, but was a scalable product. And that was in 2019. And I needed a little bit of money to help scale the business. So I was doing, you know, pitching to various places. And I remember I walked in, uh, I had a meeting with uh, the company True Turbines back in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I was giving a demo of the unit. And I remember at the end of my presentation, uh, I was, you know, telling people, well, I have pre-sales and I need, you know, more than money because I needed a little bit of startup capital, but not a lot. More than that, I needed people to help. I needed, you know, a business partner. And that's kind of what I was looking for. And I met uh, who's now become a very close friend, uh, Brian Quo, who's our CFO, and uh, really, you know, built VapeJet with me from pretty much the beginning. Um, we met and I uh, dropped all my other consulting clients, moved into a tiny little warehouse next to a... Uh, sewage treatment plant, because that's where you get the best rent and started building these, uh, started building these machines by hand out of a little rented garage uh, in uh, just south of Portland. We cash rolled the business and ended up where we are at today. So that's kind of the origin story there. That's so cool. I mean, that's a really cool story, but also so inspirational, you know, and, and also another thing that I've, 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 I've just been in the industry for about four and a half years. And one of the things I really see in this industry is I feel like we're starting an, an, an industrial revolution with this whole industry because of all the customized machinery that we need, you know, from cultivation to supply chain, uh, you know, processes. Um, and that's why I was actually really interested in talking to you, someone who's looking at that supply chain or finding these needs, um, you know, and customizing and building what's going to be the future equipment that probably everybody will be using or the beginning of it. So uh, I, I, I think um, that that's really, you know, what I find really interesting. So Okay, so now getting into your product um, in the industry. So, so now, so the company has been around for four or five years, and you're, I guess, iterating different, uh, you know, solutions um, as the industry change changes. You know, as people's tastes and are changing from, you know, straight distillate to like rosin products that um, these that that the uh, concentrate um, is, is it doesn't work in the, the initial, I think, vape chat uh, machines that you first built. So maybe can you just talk about um, how things are changing in, in that direction? Absolutely. It, it comes down to design philosophy, really. Um, we have a continual improvement pro uh, process. We continually improve our product. We do not lock things down 
Um, we do not, to a certain level, you have to have design controls and release cadence and everything else like that. But I tend to lean towards the move fast, break things mentality, um, trying not to break as many things. Also understanding this is manufacturing. You can't break things very bad, but also rapidly iterating, rapidly testing, and rapidly getting these ideas out onto the market. We, you know, that initial prototype VapeJet 1.0 quickly became VapeJet 2.0. Vapejet 2.0, we uh, sold to a few customers and they knew that this was an early revision of the device, um, you know, heavily discounted. That's how we cash flowed the business. Um, we took that, we only produced nine of those units total. And then we did, uh, you know, we jumped to Vapejet 3.0. And from Vapejet 3.0, from the time we released it till the time we moved to the 4.0 release, there were massive upgrades along that side. When we jumped from 3.0 to 4.0, that was again, a big leap. But even then we're continually improving our products and we try to build them with knowing that the market is going to change. So what you're saying as, you know, taste change and whatnot. Yeah, we, we saw the direction the market was moving with different, uh, types of extracts, and we built to accommodate that. A good story to illustrate that process, not necessarily that, but a good story to illustrate that is um, back 2021 timeframe, um, 510 carts were still, ev they were still absolutely dominating the market. If you had a vape, it was 95% chance it was a 510. And then I started to see, you know, industry wide, um, you know, from the customers I was interacting with. And when we started to look at the data, I was seeing, okay, well, this month, you know, the all in ones, the with the batteries attached and everything, the disposables, those were, you know, three to 4%. So nothing really to, you know, it's a blip on the radar, but nothing to really be concerned about. Then the next month I saw they were, you know, six to 7%. And I was like, that, that's growing pretty quick. And then the next month I saw they were 9%. And I had a meeting with everyone was like, we need to design around this. And nowadays I can tell you they're over 70% of what we see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which if you go on my LinkedIn, you will see all of my rants about how I do not how I want to see this consumer behavior changed. I won't spend a lot of time on that one. I will say, pressure your lawmakers to please get the things outlawed. <laughs> uh, just throwing away lithium is a bad idea, everyone. Please don't do it. Um, but anyway, from a market perspective, and I have to serve my customers, I'm not gonna let idealism get in the way of reality. If that's the way the market is going, I have to serve the market. We took our designs and we're like, okay, how do we how do we evolve our product to be the best option for filling these devices moving forward? And we did. Um, funny story on that. That was during, you know, somewhat unrelated. When we made the jump from 3.0 to 4.0, we rewrote all the software. So we completely rewrote the software from the ground up to make it more efficient. And the reason was we had to do a little bit more of machine vision work, which required a bigger computer because of the disposables being needing some extra processing power. But when we rewrote all that software, we rewrote it in a way that we could actually backport it to the 3.0 units. So even you know two years after the release of the first 3.0 unit, I was able to send an email out to everyone saying, hey, let's update your software. I'm about to boost your throughput by 30%. And we were able to do that even for machines that have been in the field for over two years. So that's you know the benefit of taking a continual improvement process approach to things, but also designing with the future in mind. Another thing I'd say design philosophy, something that I try to remind myself of all the time when I'm designing products, is never ever design a product that's needed today. 
design the product that's going to be needed six months to a year from now, because that's how long it's going to take you to even get a prototype off the ground and get your market study there. You have to be building. And when you're building for the future, when you're building a product that is supposed to be used in the future, you also have to keep your mind on what tools, what resources, and what products are available to me in the future. If Just because something is impossible to accomplish today with the tools or the resources you have available, you need to look at six months to 12 months down the line and try to anticipate what your capabilities were will be then and design around that. So, so, so basically your first machine was just filling cartridges mm -hmm. and then the second one, and which takes, I guess, a different process was filling the disposables. I, I, is that what, right? The same machine fills them all. We, it's an evolution of the machine through software and through little design tweaks that enable it to work with all these. So even the very first VapeJet 3.0, 2.0 units would be able to fill disposables. They just oh. need the software available to them and everything to, to do that. Oh, okay, so it's the software upgrade. It's not the actual physical machine that's that's filling the vapes themselves that you had to adjust. And that no, that, that's been adjusted over time as well. So we design it, and then every time we create an upgrade for it, what we do is we take a reference machine and we install that upgrade to it, and then we create processes and procedures around that upgrade and send it out. Okay. So a good example is a good, great example and kind of forward looking. Um, we were just able very recently to get VapeJet working with uh, self sealing devices. So, devices that don't require capping, it's a puncture seal and fill type device. One of the things, VapeJet 4.0 natively was not compatible with that because on a technical level, the needle has to go into this membrane and the needle has to pull out of the membrane. Well, there's a lot of force on that membrane and you'll pull the entire tray up if you're trying to fill it that way. So we had to have a way to anchor it down. Well, the way the vape jet system has always worked in the past is you don't anchor things down to the tray. You just kind of adjust for it on the fly with software. Well, now we required actually anchoring something down so it couldn't be pulled up. So we replaced the material in the tray, which moves the cartridges around from aluminum to steel. We made it a little bit thinner because of you know strength requirements. It still serves the original purpose, still works fine. But now that it's steel, now we're including magnets on the bottom of those self-sealing devices. So it magnetizes down to the base. Mm -hmm. So an existing 4.0 customer can say, hey, we need to be able to fill self-sealing devices. We'll say, okay, you need to upgrade to a steel tray. We're going to send that out to you, and here's procedures on how to install it. And then we'll remote in and get with them. So e even the hardware itself evolves over time with the market. And we design with that in mind. The big upgrades, the 3.0 to the 4, or 2.0 to 3.0, 3.0 to 4.0, that is when we, that those delineate the times where we do make the decision to be like, look, we can't upgrade this old platform anymore. We need to make more fundamental design choices where we can't con continue to be constrained by the old device. We have to iterate a new version. So all the 4.0s, they'll be able to get all the upgrades to be a modern 4.0, even the, like the ones we're releasing today. So if you bought a 4.0 at the beginning, or if you bought a 4.0 today, you're still going to be available that same machine is going to be available to you, but through upgrades. But a 4.0 customer or a 3.0 customer wouldn't be able to get the upgrades that the 4.0 is because we're new we machine design new. constraints in mind. Right. So do you have competition now? I mean, I, I, I assume you're the first to come out with this vape filling machine, no. what you were talking about. No, no, no. There's, there's a, there, there's healthy competition in the market. Um, there and there's some really good solutions out there as well. Um, you know, I, I can say some of our competitors really focus on certain market segments and do really well there. Um, for example, I'm not gonna without naming names, um, I can say one of our competitors really focuses on doing one SKU very efficiently. And I will say they do that. They do a great job at it. 
if you have to change from say a 510 to a disposable, that is not the machine you wanna be trying to change things on. Our machine, it's a click of a button. So we're appealing to, do, there's healthy competition in the market. There are unique selling points between the different machines. And I'd encourage everyone to do your research and really look into the market as a whole if you're gonna be purchasing you know, large equipment like this. But I will say, check us out. Um, we really do live by continual improvement and we evolve with the industry and we design for the industry. I know um, that there's a demand or I've been seeing um, a disposable vape and a, kind of a trend coming out with the dual flavored uh, yeah. devices. Um, what do you see as far as trends coming out or things like that? And how, how are you adapting? We've definitely seen the infused pre-rolls, like uh, so many infused pre-rolls. We, we've seen that on, that's been a big initiative this year is making sure VapeJet is working well with that. Um, oh, so th that. Yeah, the, the same machine which fills disposables and cartridges. So you can put a tray of pre-rolls on the vape jet and we infuse pre-rolls as well. It's a product called Fuel Injector. You can see it on the website. So that is something we've definitely we've definitely seen that trend. We there's a lot of uh a lot of movement around that. I on a technical level, I'm really happy with the solution that we came up with because pre there's so many different sizes and tapers and everything in pre-rolls we actually came up with a completely parametric manufacturing process for the jigs so basically people can give us dimensions and within a day or two we can have custom jigs all designed it's a really cool process but so infused pre-rolls definitely seeing the market run that way um larger tanks you know we're seeing a move towards two milliliter Three milliliter. Yeah, I just four milliliter. Saw that. Yeah, I just seeing a move towards that. I will say I have my concerns with the longevity of the atomizers. Um, you know, the 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 ceramics and the atomizers in the hardware itself is evolving, but I don't know if it's evolved quite fast enough to keep up with the larger volumes to the point where you know the first gram or so through that device will taste good, but then the second it'll start to degrade the element will degrade over time and the longevity of the coils isn't quite there. So I, I do think that'll be solved over time. So that's one direction I see the dual. Oh, go ahead. I just, yes. So I just wanted to clarify the atomizers in the, so what, like you mean, so, so we're used to seeing one gram cartridges, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's the maximum I've seen until recently. I just noticed two grams. Okay. And Right. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, so you're saying that the the current technology can't process uh, vape that that much uh, concentrate. Is that the, where the issue is? The problem? I'm not saying that it can't. I'm sure there are there are companies out there um, that are definitely leading in innovation in doing that. But there is a lot of competition in the hardware market, and a lot of companies aren't. They're taking an atomizer that was designed for one milliliter, putting it into a two milliliter device, and wondering why the last milliliter out of that device tastes so bad. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So uh, these aren't universal truths. These are this is the industry is evolving. Here, are kind of the pain points, and currently that is one of the pain points. There are companies out there that really do pay attention to these things. And are you know they're designing their atomizers around the larger oil volumes, um, and then there's the dual flavor device. Yeah, I yeah, guess. yeah. No, that's that. Um, we're seeing a lot of that as well. Uh, several different of the big uh, hardware manufacturers are all kind of coming out with that one somewhat at the same time. Uh, it's been interesting to see. Obviously, there's first movers and everything else. I'm hopefully not offending anybody out there. I'm not trying to. I'm just saying it, it, that was a big thing that came onto our radar kind of all at once from many different directions. And that's been a recent thing. And it's been also been interesting to see how different companies have solved for the problem. Um, one of the most interesting ones, if I can name a name, I'm not trying to plug a product or anything, but one of the most interesting ones that I've seen was from Active, formerly known as AVD. They're, uh, 
off the top of my head, I forgot the name of the device right now. I'm sorry, you guys, but oh, it's yeah. a magnetic, it, it clips together for the dual uh, flavors. So it's a magnetic packaging. It, it's really cool how they, how they did that one, but we're seeing a lot of different innovative solutions around dual flavor, or I've even seen more. Uh, I, I see some really weird hardware designs get sent into us sometimes. It's stuff that never makes it out onto on to the market, thankfully. Oh, wow. Oh, so that's interesting. So you're seeing things that people are even trying to innovate and trying to get you to manufacture probably uh, under your company. Is that? We have a process. So if you go to our website and go to support compatibility request, there's a form that anybody can fill out, hardware manufacturer, although we prefer our customers do it because this takes a lot of work. Um, but anybody's available to do this. Fill out the form. It's a compatibility request. And it'll give you back a number. You write that number on the outside of the box. You we print you out a label. It gives you the address. Send it in to us. We take it out of the box, we photograph it, we catalog it, we evaluate it, we see if it's compatible with our products, and we give it a once over. So through that process, I've seen a lot of, hey, what do you think uh, about this? I've seen some, most of the time I say, interesting. Not, oh, that's really good idea. No, usually it's interesting. Very uh, rarely though, it's like, that's a really good idea. That's why I call out to active in the magnetic devices. I. So what are some challenges in manufacturing that somebody might have that they come to you uh, about or problems that you've solved? I... The thing that I've found in this industry is the everyone's process is so different. Everyone is like, there's, you go to two different labs, even within the same MSO, and you're going to have two wildly di different outcomes. You know, I not naming names here, not naming names, but you know who you are and you know why I'm saying this. These are friends. It's it, it's crazy to me that the same exact equipment in Arizona, given very similar input material, is producing such a wildly different product than that same exact SOP in California. Mm -hmm. it, so what I'm saying, these problems all seem to be very unique to the particular place, the product, the growing conditions, the crop. Um, cannabis is a tricky, tricky thing, um, especially on the extraction side, not to do bulk. I mean, if you're just going to process everything down to distillate and returp it back up, yeah, your SOP is probably going to work everywhere. Just throw it in there and get it done. When we're trying to, you know, do resins, rosins, anything live, anything live, anything like that, it's, I know it's a science. I know this is a science. But the way that we have to approach it right now, because it's not completely understood, is more akin to alchemy. Mm. So, so right. So basically, they've got to get it right. Well, they've got to get it right in the extraction process. I mean, the grow, too. You're right. All the way down the line, really. I mean, it's all the way down the line. And then how how people um, consume it. So it's a, it's a really interesting... Yeah. supply yeah. process. So without like talking about any specific one issue, because I can't really think of any one that I'd like to use as an example story, I'll say it's about the process. Mm -hmm. It really is about the process of working with your customers and having a collaborative process, not just one thing that I, I, that is a core tenet of vape jet and of me as a person, I'm not going to sell you a piece of equipment and abandon you. Like, um, Post sales, so, uh, we invest more into post sales than we do in pre sales. Mm -hmm. um, laying it out there, and the reason for that is we like to grow with our customers. It, it, the best thing we can possibly do is to have a customer come to us and be like, "Hey, we're having a really, you know, we're really small. Can you hook us up with a deal? You know, yeah, can you really help us out?" And we're like, "Well, we have the jet fuel. It's the smaller size of things." I've had people start with that. And again, you know who you are. Um, people start with that and a fold up table from Walmart. And now they're an MSO taken over the East Coast. Um, and that yeah. having that collaboration and that tight feedback loop with your customers is vital, especially if you're doing equipment. 
And especially in this industry, as we're all flying the plane and learning at the same time. So I guess that kind of like that leads me into my final question, which is, well, if we have time for one more, but the kind of the final one is if I was a, a new brand wanting to, you know, um, uh, launch a vape line, um, is there any advice that you would give someone as far as, you know, just what to consider? I know we've co covered a lot as far as, I mean, like know your grow, you know, your extraction, but you know, what considerations, like when you, what are the common things you're helping these new entrepreneurs with as they're trying to get launched? Start small. I'm, I'm, I'm helping them with the manufacturability and the scaling side of things, not so much on the launch side of things. Typically, if you're getting our equipment, you've already launched because you, there is the availability of just grabbing a syringe and a heat gun and filling, and you can do that. It doesn't scale well. So the problems that I'm helping people with are generally as they're taking a brand where they've found product market fit and they have demand and they're having orders stack up, but they, you know, are not, there's no clear pathway as to how to fill all those orders unless, you know, you start hiring a bunch of people and now you have HR overhead and now hiring and managing large teams that requires another manager and there's all these things. So what we're helping people with is how to stay very lean, is how to do things with a few key people instead of having very large teams that become unwieldy and honestly appeal to a different type of business operator. You know, your business operator that is managing 500 to 1,000 employees, they're going to have the resources available to scale up and down teams like that very quickly. But as you're scaling a business, at, right after you found product market fit is not the time where you want to be dealing with a bunch of HR headaches. So you need to be really careful and very key with your hires and giving them the tools and the resources and everything they need to be as efficient as possible. So what am I helping them with? It's generally finding some of those key people that can, you know, finding someone that can both run the vape jet and do a packaging line and mix the stuff over here, finding those unique set of skills. That's something we do help people with and, you know, giving feedback on that side of things and what to look out for on those hires or what to look out for, in scaling products. One thing that I try to really reinforce to a lot of these uh, people that are, you know, found product market fit and are trying to scale is after you buy that piece of automation equipment, you're still in between on that scaling curve. You're not at the point where you're at going to be able to run that machine 24 seven and get full utilization out of it. So something that I really like helping those small startups do is launch more SKUs, put out more products so that your machine efficiency goes up. So your employee efficiency goes up. If you are in the middle of scaling your vape brand, but you can only run the machine for four hours a day, do, do some capsules, do some infused pre-rolls. Let's get you going on. Get, let's get some more products in there to fill those out. You can drop those as time goes on or scale those out themselves. But it's really key to fully utilize all your resources, especially as you're scaling a business. Right. So you, so the the vape jet can be used as a pre-roll infuser and yeah. a capsule and uh, fill capsules. Yes. That's pretty amazing. I mean, you're right. There, why not have all three of those SKUs right there? As, as an option, because those are three different types of customers that are maybe the same, but capsules is different than a vapor than a, and you know. Let me say, this is not a good capsule filler. The vape jet is not good at filling capsules. It's pretty good at infusing pre-rolls compared to what I've seen out there. But in terms of capsules or tincture bottles, will it fill tincture bottles? Absolutely. It fills tincture bottles. Not very well. Okay. But it could be it's like. Designed. It's not designed for that, but can it do it? Yes. And can you use the same machine to have a bunch of different SKUs and get your machine utilization up to near that 100% range? Yes, you can. And once, it, I'll put it this way, if you start a tincture line and the vape jet can't keep up with demand, you should probably go and buy yourself a bottle filler. Right. Or if you're doing, you know, gel caps and, you know, you've 
you're, you're doing trays of 100 in the vape jet and, you know, you're pushing the little gel cap tops on. And if that's starting to become a popular product for you, you should probably go buy a capsule filler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the vape jet, it's going to be able to do those things with the same thing you're already using for something you know is going to sell. And that's the, that's your cartridges. And is, is your equipment um, dummy proof or does it really take a lot of training? Uh, you know, how, what, what kind of level there? I know you just spoke about the person who can do all those different things. If you are just filling cartridges, part of that post-sale support thing is that high technical competency level. We have that on staff and our response time is under 20 minutes during business hours. Mm -hmm. Um with, I could go on a whole spiel about that. It's salesy. I'm not going to. I will say, if you're interested in what makes us different, different, really talk to our sales and ask them about our support process. Um, we handle that technical stuff on our side. Now, if you're going to be the type of customer that's switching between doing, you know, five tens and then go to all in ones and then do some pre roll infusion in the afternoon and maybe some tincture bottle filling, that's going to require a uh, some more technical education and training on the machine. The machines are meant to be as dummy proof as possible, but they're dummy proof for what they're intended to do, which is fill cartridges. It's not dummy proof when you're like switching SKUs. That takes a certain level of training and reading the manual. Our documentation, it's not difficult, but it's also something we would prefer to train operators on before they attempt to do it themselves. And we do that just how we're doing here over Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, we screen sharing we you know we have cameras and all the other things and we really collaboratively work with our customers and do training like this when you buy vape jet you have a year of support and warranty service which includes training open up a ticket and schedule training with us if you don't feel comfortable doing it or what some of our other customers do is they don't need that training they're only you know they're only introducing a new device maybe once a month or maybe once every couple months they're adding something new to the system so when they do, they just call us up, we remote in and we set that up and that's included with purchase. You know, that's not, we're not charging extra for that except for in year two, three, four. Yes, we charge for extended warranties and, you know, support and whatnot. That's part of our business model. And here's the thing, we include it with the first year purchase because we want to show to you it's worth it to buy it. it, it it's worth it to purchase this from us because we have your back and we hope we can build that in the first year working with you. That, okay, great. So um, I guess the very last question would be is I always because I'm on the East Coast, I'm in New York, and mm -hmm. I'm always we're so far behind out here. And I always love to talk to someone who's really in the thick of it in Oregon, you know, way up West Coast, you know, of what's what's kind of trending. I, I felt like last year, everybody was doing infused diamonds and um, you know, things like that, maybe not even in the vape world, but just in any, any products that are, what do, what are you seeing in Oregon coming it's, out? Of market? It's the infused pre-rolls. It's, it's the, it's the, infused, it's the pre-roll and not just infuse, but I'm also seeing, and yeah, this is a polarizing subject. Um, but I'm also seeing a lot in the altering of the flavor, not necessarily, um, not necessarily like just spraying a bunch of garbage, you know, cannabis with terpenes and trying to pass it off as good. No, I'm saying taking rather good product and using very light amounts of terpenes to enhance it, like maybe terpene papers or flavored papers or various things like that. I'm seeing a lot of people playing with the flavor and the aroma experience outside of just the flower, which again, that's a polarizing Oops, Rose. Rose. Shit. Hello? Hello? Hello?
Ryan. Ryan. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Oh, sorry. Hold on. I have a terrible uh, sirens going by here. <laughs> Let's see. Did you lose internet, Ryan? Yes. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, that's okay. No Wi-Fi oh. is yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay, so um, okay, we we have five minutes. I don't yeah. for your for your cutoff. So you were saying that um, uh, it's very uh controversial. You mean uh, oh, adding terpenes? Is that what you're saying? Or it's it, it's not controversial per se. It, it's more polarizing. Some people are all about it, and other people are like, you're messing with the natural. State oh, of the oh, terpenes. about adding terpenes? You mean yeah, or any other flavorants or anything? Yeah. You know? Yeah, but I will say I'm seeing that as a trend and seeing that very, you know, become more popular along with the infused pre rolls. Um, uh, I'm seeing infused pre rolls just pop up everywhere, left and right. Um, right, right. And just every sort of, you know, every everything you can think of on the infused pre roll side of things. Um, and then, like we were talking about earlier on the vape side of things. Um, definitely seeing a major shift in the it, it, I won't say it's a major shift you'll see growth in the high end of the vape cart market so your resins your rosins that oh. sort of I'm not necessarily seeing shrinkage in the distillate market as I'm seeing growth over there that doesn't seem to be take that seems to be the growth of the segment overall, whereas distillate just seems to be pretty steady. Okay. Wow. I think that's, that's great. Unless you want to end with something that I've missed, but I feel like um, it's just great insights into, for someone who's looking to add vapes to their product line and what to consider, you know, yeah. Because when you're building a brand, you're always thinking about all the other things in your logo and this and that. But you know what is the actual process and and what you need to know um, for business efficiency, operational efficiency. So, yeah, um, and I will say, you know, if I can, I'll, I'll leave with yeah. one thing: is like you were saying, you know, you get tied down in logos and website and this and that and the other thing. Learn your AI tools, everyone. Because that takes me all of 15 minutes these days. Oh, uh, yeah. But I was going to actually ask you about AI in the vape hardware. Uh, is that what you're talking about or just in general? Like AI is already a big part of our workflows. If a ticket gets opened. So if you go to your vape jet and you click help and you say new ticket and you say my needle is broken, help. That ticket goes to a database. And the first thing that happens is the AI system reads what you wrote. It reads all of our documentation. It reads all of our previous support history requests. It formulates a response. It puts all that in there. And then it responds to the ticket internally, not to back to you. We don't send this to you. Internally, it gives us oh, the full it gives us the full history of your machine. It gives us the full history of the problem. It gives us references to every time that's happened in the past. And then it gives us something to copy and paste and then edit a little bit and send back to you. And that's all happening in real time. And this isn't Verizon. This is VapeJet. Yes, that's a great example of how people can use it and integrate it and how should they should be integrating into their business, like you said. Right. Like we, we wrote a little bit of internal software. It wasn't complicated. This was a weekend, this was a weekend project, but it reaches out to our HubSpot 
and it reads all the customer details from HubSpot. And then it reaches out to our ticketing system and it reads all those. And then it summarizes all that and gives you a real quick summary, real time, that includes everything up to date. So it's not the account history that the account rep wrote six months ago. No, it's real time account history. And within 60 seconds of you submitting a ticket, our support agents have that much contextual knowledge of the account. That is something that's within reach to everyone. And if you want to know more, reach out. I, I love helping businesses set stuff up like this. But oh, that's a really good example. That's fantastic. That's a great way to end. And I just...